Thank you very much, Robert. I appreciate very much that um, people like Robert and David and even Peter, the next one, they come from America here, make a very long journey just to speak for 15 minutes. It's a little shame um, to have only this small time, um, but um, the more I appreciate that you took over due to this very long um, journey to come here. The next is a um, very special person, it's Peter Stasny. Um, and I can tell you, Peter Stasny, I met the first time in 91, or 92, and um, he's the one who translated the first time an article from me into English. He was a psychiatrist, and it was he, and later we met and get very good friends, and I meanwhile met him quite often and publish a book together with him, and it's a great pleasure for him, for me, to present him here, because it's not very well known in Germany, even if he speaks um, German, especially not very well known in the user survivor community. Peter Stasny, as I said, was born in Vienna, where he graduated from medical school in 76, and since 78, he has been working, residing in New York City. He is, he is associate professor of psychiatry at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx and has conducted several publicly funded research projects in the area of vocational rehabilitation. No? No, he's going through my slides. No, 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 sorry. Social support and self help in collaboration with individuals who had survived personal crisis and psychiatric interventions. Currently, he is working on the development of alternative services that obviate psychiatric intervention and often autonomous paths towards recovery and full integration. These activities have engendered a close collaboration with the youth survival movement is manifested by joint research projects, publications, service demonstrations, and community work. Welcome. I guess the trick is here to speak fast. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, as you can see, I have to speak English. I can speak German. But anyway, I lived, like Peter said, for 30 years in New York City. And recently I got a new bicycle, and on uh, Sunday, this past Sunday, I took it out for a little ride through Manhattan. And I started on the top of Manhattan, uh, you know, checking out the skyline, and I began with this uh, new building called the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Um, new York City has uh, the highest number of inpatient beds per 100,000 people in the world. It's 142, and that must be... Uh, absolutely skyrocketed. I spoke to Professor Kassin, who said he's very proud that in Lower Austria there's only five beds per uh, 100,000. Um, Manhattan, of course, is the highest, followed by uh, Brooklyn has less, 81, Bronx, and so forth. So these are some of the uh, sites that you will find. This is the old psychiatric institute on the right, fought with the towers of, with the staff groups. Um, this is the new Bellevue Hospital. You'll see the old one later. This is a view from Roosevelt Hospital in Midtown, and uh, this is the uh, Pain Whitney Institute on the east side. The total number of bed in New York, beds in New York City is 5,400. Now, uh, there are also in New York City 36 psychiatric emergency rooms. Uh, these 36 psychiatric emergency rooms are um, seeing an average of 12 people per day, which adds up to approximately 430 visits per day to all the emergency rooms. Now, 50% um, of the people on average who go to these emergency rooms, this is Harlem Hospital, by the way, uh, are admitted. That's approximately, that's about 78,000 people per year. Of those, these are rough estimates. I mean, I really didn't go and look at all the data. It's very complicated to actually get those data. But 60% uh, are admitted on an involuntary basis. That's 168 people per day. The total is for the seven thousand people a year are admitted in New York City on an involuntary basis to psychiatric hospital. And these are the places of access. These are the places where people enter the psychiatric system. It's interesting, I don't want to go into depth, but the fact that New York City is based 
on ERs as a way to access the system is, uh, is a little atypical in, in Europe. This is not so. So uh, after uh, checking out all these various ports of access, these entry points into the mental health system, I didn't go to all 36, I started to have a delusion. And the delusion that I've had was, what if someday New York City will be free, this by the way is the old Bellevue Hospital, uh, will be free, and this is the emergency room in the new Bellevue Hospital, of course, of psychiatry. What would happen if all psychiatrists in New York City were suddenly stripped of their ability to admit patients to these hospitals by virtue of their signature? What would actually happen? Um, well, quickly, and the first thing that would happen is people who work in these places would have to start thinking about helping people rather than triaging people. We have to think about rather than making decisions who goes in and who doesn't go in, they would have to figure out how to actually address the situation that people are presenting with. Um, maybe some of the things that they would do is that people would actually stop being brought physically to those places. Maybe those would not be the best places to actually think about helping people. Maybe uh, uh, instead of just transporting people to places, they would think of providing care wherever people are, or uh, possibly um, working also with families. These are controversial issues. Create residential alternatives and peer support and regulatory services. But let's say, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, let's say we're talking about 47,000 people that need alternatives in New York City. 47,000 people per year. Um, now, interestingly enough, 15% of those people, when they come to the emergency room, they're actually homeless. So, one of the things that these alternatives would have to include is a place for people to live. So instead of um, a hospital, they might need a crisis respite or an emergency service. Most people who come to the emergency rooms come from live with families. What's interesting is that 80% 80, 80 of those people could stay there, right there, where they live, if given adequate support, which would really reduce homelessness by quite a bit. So that's, that's actually about 32,000 people we're talking about. How to help them, though, how to really reach out. I guess instead of 36 emergency rooms, you would have to have 36 teams of people that could deal each with two or three crisis situations and then maybe follow people. Well, who exactly should be on this team is another question, but they could follow people for a month and maybe sometimes even longer if it's desirable. Now, that leaves about 8,000 people. It still leaves 8,000 people who might need more intensive services. Now, we're talking about not having the ability to commit people to hospitals, right? We're still talking about that. What would happen to those 8,000 who may need more than just support in their homes, who may need more than just emergency respite? What would happen to them? Well, I guess some of those 4,000, some at least half of them, could benefit from something like a soteria house or a user-run crisis center. Um, I guess that would mean we would need about 40 houses, if each house has an average of 10 people, we need about 40, I guess 12 in Brooklyn, because it's the largest number, 9 in Queens, 9 in the Bronx, and so forth. Um, now, 2,000 of those 8,000 that need more intensive support might have medical conditions, and they might actually need to be admitted to a medical, the medical part of the hospital. So that leaves two to 3,000 people, which is actually 5% of the current total of all people that are being admitted, where you might have to think about what to do in order to get some sort of help, not psychiatrists, but you might have to go to a court. Now, without going into details of what would happen if psychiatrists were stripped of that right and how people could still be in some ways given help if, if they lack capacity, like you know, Dr. Smucker said, that there should be a separate legis uh, legislation that's equal to all people, not just focusing on people with psychiatric issues. And in, in essence, there would be some court hearings. One would assume that there would be court hearings. But it would be a very small number of court hearings compared to what's going on now. There may be uh, five to eight court hearings for the entire city of New York per day. It's a relatively small number. Uh, by the way, the, I don't want to get into that whole subject of how to do that. It can be done. It can be done so that psychiatrists are not the ones to actually propose treatment and then force people to accept it from the same person. It can be done, I'm sure. But what we really need in order to do this, essentially, is to retrain 
the entire staff, of the, especially of the places that I'm talking about here, the emergency rooms and the hospital, inpatient units will only consist of voluntary patients, with some exceptions, a small number of court mandated people. 100% of the emergency room staff could be reassigned to new, new work, and probably at least 50% of the hospital staff could be reassigned to do different work. Now, how do we do this? Now, one way of doing this is to create an organization like INTAR. An organization like INTAR is composed of people who devoted their entire life to create alternatives for people like the 47,000 people that are being voluntarily admitted every single day, uh, in, I mean, every single year in New York City. Uh, INTAR includes such places as the Runway House in Berlin. INTAR includes, I don't have all the pictures, it's just, I think it's just really quickly, INTAR includes such places like Windhorse and Soteria and uh, it considers and deals with people who have worked in a series of approaches that are all non-course, that are often non-medication based, that are certainly non-hospital based, and that are certainly user friendly and user involving. And those, those are some of them without going into great depth. Uh, the critical family support is an approach in Toronto that deals with family, involves family members in, in a very different way than psychoeducational approaches to open dialogue in Finland and the uh, parachute project in Stockholm focuses essentially on people that have first episodes that have never been hospitalized and really concentrates on providing alternative ways, often without drug, 40%, maybe even more of people who go through the parachute but are never exposed to the low levels. Um, so Teria, Second Opinion Society is a user-run service in, in uh, Yukon. Uh, basically, I'm mentioning this to bring together these, this group of people in order to create a resource base, an information base, for the entire city of New York if it decides to actually do what I'm suggesting. Now, of course, we're talking about the whole world now, and if you take the numbers for the entire world, the test would be similarly, it's truly daunting, right, because we're really talking about millions of people. So how to multiply, the challenge is really how to multiply the information and wisdom and experience and expertise that's contained in the people that are represented in INTAR and many others, by the way, because INTAR doesn't represent everybody. How to do that, how to channel that into a direction that can really have a mass effect, a uh, scalable. Recently, we had a conversation with the director of the Department of Mental Health in New York City, and we proposed a crisis house on the Lower East Side for 10 people, 10 people out of 47,000, potentially. And he said, well, this sounds like not a bad idea, although why are you citing Lauren Mosher here? Do you think you're helping yourself? In any case, he said, but this, even if it's a good idea, it has to be scalable. This is kind of what made me think of the scalable means. It has to, you have to be able to explode this thing and make it massively. I mean, I know, I think you know what I'm talking about, because otherwise, in the end, I'm really sorry for my voice, because I had a bit of a cold, so I'm losing my voice. Otherwise, um, people's experiences and people's stories and people's lives would end up being contained <clears throat> over and over again in these type of places, in suitcases such as these that we found in an attic of a state psychiatric hospital that belonged to former patients who most of them spent their life there, many, of course, all of them against their will. They had nowhere else to go, but they also were forced to be there. And if we do not do this, if we do not accomplish this, not only will there be more and more coercion, there will also be more and more sad outcomes, sad stories, and more suicide for people like this young lady here, who was one of the owners of the suitcases, who essentially was enveloped by the mental health system and its laws for the rest of her life. Thank you. Thank you.